Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a little closer look at our static friction and kinetic friction. Uh, we'll see, we're going to have to actually modify one of our equations a little bit because it isn't entirely accurate. Now, when we're dealing with static friction, okay, one of the very important part of this is that the net force on the object is zero. All right? You know, take a look again at our crate example. So with the crate here, I'm going to start, I'm just going to put a very little force on it. There is a force on it, hopefully you can tell from, you know, I don't know, my fingers or whatever, all right? There's a very little force on it, and in order for the net force to still be zero, in order for the object to not be accelerating, the force of static friction opposing that is also going to be very little. Basically, it's equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And notice what happens if I double the force. That's right, I'm exactly doubling the force. I don't know, maybe, whatever. If I double the force that I apply to this, then the force of static friction has obviously doubled as well. And if I triple the force, it triples it. And we see that the static friction, in some ways, we can almost say it responds to the applied force that I am exerting on it. And it's also not a constant thing, right? If I push very lightly, this force of static friction is only a very small force. If I push a little more vigorously, then the force of static friction is also different than it was before and matches my force. It's not until I get to a certain force of push that I will actually have a push that is greater than the force of static friction and the object will be moving and experiencing kinetic friction at that point. But let's take a look at that again. First off, we'll do it graphically. Okay. So if we graph the applied force, in this case the force of my push, to the force of friction, we will see that at first the force of friction very much responds to my force. It's equal. It's not just a direct relationship. It is a one-to-one -one relationship, right? The slope of that line there should be one, okay? Um, mind you, this is not the coefficient of friction. This is the force of friction and the applied force, not the normal force. But we'll notice, too, that this right here, this is the force of static friction. I'll call it F FRS. And eventually, like we said, there comes to a point where my push is more than the force of static friction can respond to. And it becomes kinetic friction, which we know has a smaller coefficient, and it stays the same. Now, we'll see something interesting with this. We've got a maximum force of static friction here, right? It varies, it changes all along here until we get up to the maximum force of static friction. And this is the point in which our equation somewhat is, well, not entirely accurate. Because it is at this point that we can actually use our equation. This is when it is equal to mu s times the normal force. But again, it is not always equal to that. One thing, the force of static friction can definitely be less than that, but never more than that. So we actually have to modify our equation here to show that, that the force of friction is equal to or less than 
that value? Well, we generally say it's less than or equal to. It means the same thing, though. So this is our equation for the force of static friction. And if we're just talking about the maximum force of static friction, well, we've got an equation for that. That is what we've got right here. Okay. Any other time before that, that equation won't really help us. We'll have to determine the force of static friction from other factors at that point. And those will be made clear within the context of, of, the, of the problem that we're trying to solve. You know, we can think of it as the force of my push. If I knew the exact force of my push, I could tell you the force of static friction at any point in here. Um, we've got that. Now, we notice something, too, that one thing, the force of kinetic friction, remember, is always going to be less than this value. We saw that based off of the uh, coefficients of kinetic friction versus those of static friction. And another thing, too, we see that it's constant. Even if we apply more and more force to it, which is happening as we go in this direction on our graph, the applied force gets larger, but the force of kinetic friction remains the same. Now, notice, too, that as the applied force gets larger and the kinetic force remains the same, the object should be accelerating, and that acceleration should be happening more and more and more as it goes. Um, and so, yet, the force of kinetic friction stays the same. Now what this shows us is that it's not dependent on the velocity of the object. Okay? The force of kinetic friction is not dependent on the velocity of the object. All right? We'll notice too that it's not dependent on the area of contact between the two. The area of contact between the two doesn't enter into our equation at all. It's merely the normal force and the coefficient of friction will tell us the magnitude of the force of friction in this case. Now, it's also important to note that the force of friction is perpendicular to the normal force in any given case. So this is not a vector equation because those two are perpendicular to one another. So we can't treat it quite like a vector. We have to determine the f direction of the force of friction on our own. Now, the direction is always opposite the motion of the object. Right? So, always opposite the motion of the object. Now, for static friction, it's a little more complicated of a definition than that because there is no motion of the object at that point. So it is always opposite to the um, to the component of the force that is parallel to the surface of contact. Yeah, always opposite to the component of the force that is parallel to the surface of contact. So for the force of static friction, the direction of it is always opposite to the component of the force that is parallel to the surface of contact. So always opposite So let's take a look once again at the graph that we've got here. All right, and we've seen how this uh, informs our equations and whatnot. Now, what this means here for us is that, well, if we've got to increase our force and we have to get this much force in order to start the object moving, 
Well, how much force does it take to keep the object moving? Now, there will be times at which the force of kinetic friction is going to be just equal to my applied force in that direction. But we'll see that that force is always going to be less than the force of static friction, which means to us that it is easier to keep a thing moving than it is to start a thing moving when the object itself undergoes any type of force of friction.